If this essay were to appear online, the title would qualify it as clickbait. It promises conflict, controversy, partisanship. Alas, like most clickbait, it isn't going to deliver on the terms it implies. But I hope I've got your attention now. <laughs> when I was 14, our English teacher, Mr. Grayson, introduced us to some modern poetry, firstly with poems by T.S. Eliot. We're a class of bright but not notably sensitive lads in a room a couple of miles from here at Hymas College. In the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, Eliot describes how the yellow fog that rubs its back upon the window panes, the smoke that rubs its muzzle on the window panes, licked its tongue into the corners of the evening. Reading and hearing these lines, I was excited and confirmed in an interest in poetry that had been developing quietly without my really noticing. The other poet he put before us was Ted Hughes. And when I read Hughes's early poem, Wind, with its opening line, this house has been far out at sea all night, or the account in Pike of watching by a pond as deep as England, I knew that nothing would be the same again. This was language serving to make the world seem more real than before. It was 1967. I was 14. By that summer, I could see, without much evidence to back it up, that there was nothing else for me to do but write poems. 1967 was when Ted Hughes published his third collection, Wadwo, which I got in hardback and still possess, alongside the critic Al Alvarez's famous Penguin anthology, The New Poetry, which set Ted Hughes and Philip Larkin up, if not as opponents, then as exemplars of very different approaches to poetry. Alvarez, like a lot of other people, clearly favored Hughes. His work was urgent, vivid, energetic, raw, a world away from the careful pessimistic reservations and moral distinctions which characterize Larkin's beautifully carpentered poems. Hughes versus Larkin. It was the raw versus the cooked, the country versus the city, the shaman versus the rationalist, the mythmaker versus the novelist, the alleged outsider versus the establishment figure. I was pretty quick to look into Larkin, who had a proper job in the library at Hull University, not far from where I lived. The process of conversion was slower, but I found I was reading and rereading Larkin's poems just as I read and reread Hughes's. The chill breath of mortality given off by a poem such as Larkin's Ambulances was an instructive alternative to Hughes's vitalism. The poem closes, far from the exchange of love to lie, unreachable inside a room the traffic parts to let go by brings closer what is left to come and dulls to distance all we are wadwo which came out in 1967 was a transitional book for ted hughes it was thickened with a radio play and several short stories a couple of which are among the best things he ever wrote the poems are a mixed bag, ranging from beautifully achieved economical pieces like thistles and fern to wilder, more visionary work like Gog and Out. There is a feeling that the borders of the poems are melting, some pieces are unpunctuated, and the previous minutely observant precision is often set aside in favor of a more expansive, declamatory and visionary mode. But a poem such as Fern still stops me in my tracks. This is the opening stanza. Here is the fern's frond unfurling a gesture, like a conductor whose music will now be pause and the one note of silence to which the whole earth dances gravely. Such an elegant improvisation, so gracious in its appreciation, Perhaps only later do we notice the outrageous hyperbole of that last line to which the whole earth dances gravely. There, amid this success, the seeds of Hughes's downfall were also present. 
Hughes reached back into Middle English using an extract from the 15th century Sir Gawain and the Green Knight as the book's epigraph. The book's title poem is spoken by a wood spirit or demon found in the great Midland forest that once covered much of England. Hughes might be a frame breaker, a poetic Luddite escaping from mechanization, or to switch metaphors, escaping from what he called the suffocating maternal octopus of post-Renaissance English poetic tradition, a tradition within which Larkin was, in contrast, quite comfortably accommodated. Hughes was on his way to the turning point, which was his 1970 collection, Crow, a bravura set of negations, a black hole into which the world vanished with only the figure of the crow alive, more or less, to tell the tale. A carrion bird, a survivor, a cynic, homeless both by decree of the cosmos and by inclination, He's definitely a he. He roosted among ashes and, of course, hyperbole. At this point, not that it mattered to anyone else, I withdrew my commitment from Hughes with the bitterness of a would-be completist who finds his favorite band ruining it all by having a hit. <laughs> I found myself turning to other poets, such as Peter Porter, Seamus Heaney, Derek Mahan, and Douglas Dunn. Nevertheless, I went on reading Hughes's books, trying, as it were, to pick the bones out of the sprawling, incoherent collection Gaudete and the provisional-seeming Moortown Diary to find what was durable and memorable in a body of work that became almost too large to contemplate as a whole. Philip Larkin, on the other hand, wrote less and less, in 1974, ten years after the Whitson Weddings, came Larkin's fourth and final collection, High Windows, a work containing several masterpieces, but which even in the realm of the slim volume seemed anorexic. And with occasional exceptions, Larkin's output thereafter makes depressing reading. If we compare Hughes's collected poems with Larkin's complete poems, we find two immense volumes. Hughes's poems fill his to bursting. Larkin's occupy a tiny space among the immensely detailed notes and commentary. While Larkin was running out of fuel, Hughes went on producing copiously to the end of his life. Not for him, the patient waiting for poems to suggest themselves, we might infer that overproduction was both a means and a demonstration of survival amid tragedy. You can tell when a poet has achieved general fame when people who don't read the work know about the life. This is true of Hughes, as it is of his wife, Sylvia Plath. The effort of understanding biographies or journalistic speculations is nothing compared with the serious time and thought it takes to engage with poetry. No contest in the age when the line of least resistance is supreme. How fortunate then that Hughes's posthumous collection, Birthday Letters, which is full of his memories of Sylvia Plath, seemed as though designed to be consumed by those who couldn't be bothered to read the real thing. As I began by saying, the title Ted Hughes versus Philip Larkin seems to promise conflict, and there are other contrasts between them of subject, attitude, scale, formal approach, literary ancestry, and so on. But they meet on the common ground of a regard for language and for poetry as an art made of language. This sounds like a truism, but we now live in a period of poetry when conviction, testimony, and political virtue are widely taken to outgun mere language. Ted Hughes once wrote of meanings that will not part from the rock, and as his work goes on, we sense a presiding anxiety, the need to interpret, to state meaning. The effect can preempt the imaginative work of the poem, 
But when he returns his full attention to the thing itself, the creature itself, we can see what is indisputable, a care for detail which is visionary in its intensity and leads through swarming verbal transformations to the revelation, the hyper-realization of the physical world and its creatures. An October salmon from the book River, 1980, exemplifies this. The fish has returned to his native river to die. Such sweet months, so richly embroidered into earth's beauty dress, her life robe, now worn out with her tirelessness, her insatiable quest, hangs in the flow, a frayed scarf, an autumnal pod of his flower, the mere hull of his prime, sunk at shoulder and flank, with the sea-going aurora borealis of his April power, the primrose and violet of that first uplifting in the estuary, ripened to muddy dregs, the river reclaiming his sea metals. A while back, I heard the poet publisher Michael Schmidt refer to the significant distinction between taste and judgment. I was heartened by his comments, but I sensed that the feeling of the meeting was in some ways antagonistic to them. For many, it seems that taste is what you have, as it were, your aesthetic signature and a function of your identity, in some sense unquestionable. From this position, judgment emerges as a function of your taste. Does this seem like a circular argument? Expand the frame of reference beyond the individual and we're likely to find a large degree of conformity among ostensibly individual preferences. Driven, for example, by fashion, not only in style but in morality. Even skepticism itself might be a fashion, a species of groupthink. Fashion can be as intolerant and censorious as any state-enforced cultural policy, the outcome may be a dangerous imaginative impoverishment. We can imagine that admirers of Hughes might reject Larkin and vice versa, but I'd suggest that often this doesn't have much to do with the art in which both are, in their different ways, engaged. Perhaps a more serious view of judgment would suggest that it recognizes individual preferences while requiring the reader, me for example, to identify, understand and acknowledge the qualities of work which happens not to appeal to me. A subjectivity which doesn't get the benefit of the friction produced by the effort of detachment is a trap. It becomes solipsism in the individual and groupthink in the mass. It is hard to imagine either Hughes or Larkin would be happy with that kind of admiration. I'll end by suggesting that literature, in this case poetry, is not simply a warehouse full of sealed boxes awaiting dispatch to customers who know what they're getting. It's open to the elements. It contains contradictions. In a sense, it's forever unfinished since readers turn to it afresh and argue about it, often for reasons having little to do with the poems themselves. In this stormy arena, both Ted Hughes and Philip Larkin have their necessary places. Indeed, as Larkin himself wrote, it's hard to lose either when you have both. Thank you. Mm -hmm.